Um, we talked a lot about legalism, liberty, and license. When Jesus proclaimed the coming of his kingdom, he didn't say, out with the old, in regards to the law. But he did say, and with the new, in regards to grace. Jesus came to establish his church, and there was a major correction in authority, which threw the self-professed authorities of religion into a frenzy. When Jesus came and died and rose again, he brought all who believe and proclaim him as the savior out from under the yoke of legalism into the liberty, but not into license. Last week we talked about legalism can get you into the kingdom of God. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. The bad news is that you can't be good enough to get to heaven. The good news is you haven't been bad enough to be kept out. Christian liberty is freedom in Christ. Galatians 5.1. Freedom was free to you, but it cost Jesus his life. License to sin is not Christian liberty. Romans 6, 1 through 2. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And just because you don't have to doesn't mean you shouldn't. There is perhaps no doctrine that divides the church more than the understanding or misunderstanding of God's magnificent grace. Christian legalism is toxic. Freedom is awesome. But freedom is not licensed to live any way that you want. Jesus died to set you free. Live rightly free. And now this week, Pastor Gene with the good news. Jesus himself said there's no one good but God. And if, if our Lord says it, I'm pretty sure it's going to be true. Amen. God is good. He's good to you and he loves you. He wants the best for you. And he loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for you because you had a, a warrant on your head. Do you know that you had a warrant on your head? You had a spiritual warrant. You had a sin that the Bible says that you were in the slave market of sin. You were a slave to sin. And Jesus came to set you free from that slave market of sin because there was a bond on your head and it had to be paid before you could be set free from that slave market of sin. Amen? And that's why Jesus came. We just finished our, our um, series on the Sermon on the Mount. And last week, that was kind of just kind of good. You're probably going to say, well, you've been concluding that Sermon on the Mount for three months. No, we're, we're, when it's done, it's done. <laughs> The Lord has something to say, and so I, you know, I might say we'll be done next week, and the Lord might say, well, you have still have ways to go. So he'll let us know when we're done. So we're moving on from the Sermon on the Mount. So um, last week was kind of a transition thing because when G in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus expressed some spiritual principles, some kingdom principles, and he said, blessed are those who do this, blessed are those who live like that, blessed are we, blessed are you, he says. Disciples, you guys remember that? You guys remember that, right? He, he said, blessed are those, blessed are those, blessed are they. And then he turns to his disciples, he says, blessed are you. Right? So he speaks to us directly. Do we have any disciples of Christ in here? Do we really have any disciples of Christ? And see, and what is a disciple? See, we talk about this all the time because a disciple is a student. Are you a student of the rabbi? Jesus is the great rabbi. He's the teacher. And so we are called to make disciples, Jesus says, church. Go and make disciples of all nations. Amen? But how can you make a disciple unless you too are a disciple? And being a disciple is a lifelong pursuit because none of us will ever come out in, and come into the fullness of a knowledge of God. It's a lifelong pursuit. Amen? So the Apostle Paul says, to the degree that you've apprehended, do that. And you may be sitting there today saying, I don't know much about the Bible. I don't know much at all. To the degree that you've apprehended, Use that. Share that. Amen? Amen, because you're never going to know it all. I certainly ain't going to know it all. And one thing I've learned as I've studied, and you're probably discovering the same thing, the more you know about God, the more you discover we don't know much. We don't know anything. God is awesome. God is big, and he is beyond our human understanding. But nonetheless, he gave us his letter here to us so that we might gain an insight and understanding. Amen? Amen. Does anybody want a feel-good message today? Anybody want a feel-good message? Yeah? Yeah, well, i, I got to tell you, we're going to be talking about sin, and that topic of sin is avoided in many churches and by many pastors because it, it can get uncomfortable. But I want to tell you this morning, God is okay with you being uncomfortable. Amen? 
That's a good place to be. When the Holy Spirit starts convicting you, that's a good place to be. When you start squirming in your seat, that's a good place to be. When you feel like everybody's looking at you because the pastor's talking about you, that's a good place to be because that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And, and just want to reiterate this again. When I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to me. Okay? So I'm not going to stand up here and say I got this all done. Okay? So we're all works in progress. Jesus says he would build his church. You are his church. God is building his church by building you. Amen? It works in progress. Father, we just ask that you would speak into our hearts this morning, that we may move from our minds. This truth might move from our minds into our hearts and into our spirits and into our lives. Can we say amen? amen. I want to start with Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. If anybody needs a pen, uh, somebody will bring you a pen if you raise your hand. And write, write that down. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says... He says, therefore, we all know when you see a word, therefore, you go back and see what it's there for. He's referring to chapter 11. Chapter 11 talks about the heroes of the faith. He, uh, chapter 11 is uh, sometimes called the Hall of Fame of Faith. And you'll see all these Old Testament people and they, uh, that, are, that had a good report from God. Amen. And so he says, so he says therefore, because of all this these people that we mentioned in chapter 11, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, those people that he just finished talking about, let us lay aside. That's an action. Lay it aside, everybody. Lay it aside. Lay aside every weight and the sin. Can everybody say sin? Sin and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Man, I'm telling you, if you came out of a sinful lifestyle, stay away from that stuff. Lay that stuff aside because it's going to ensnare you. It's going to drag you back down. Don't think that you're so strong enough that you can go hang out with your old friends. I'm going to drag you back down. Amen? And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. There's, God has set a course for you. The Bible says that the sons of disobedience, the world, the non-believers, are set on a course of destruction. And God has taken us off that course. And he has set us on a course of eternal life. And that is a lifelong pursuit. It's a long pursuit Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The author, I like the translation that says, the, um, the author will do for now. Looking unto Jesus, and uh, the author and finisher of our faith, for who the joy was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is our champion that author is translated pioneer. The faith pioneer. I love that. Pioneer. God wants to do a pioneering work in you. Jesus is the ultimate faith pioneer. He came down to earth. He says, I'm going to go plant my church. He came on a pioneering mission. And we are called to be faith pioneers. Well, what does that look like? I don't know. You're a pioneer. I don't know what it looks like for you. It looks different for me. And sometimes if you look at through all these people in the, in the Old Testament in particular, and even in the New Testament, God didn't lay out, this is what you're going to do, and then this ne next week you're going to do this, and then you're going to do that, and I'm going to do that. He says, no, go. Do you believe me or not? Go. And those who answered the call of God went by faith. And so if you're a pioneer this morning, you're called to be a faith pioneer, do it by faith. And if you're waiting for everything to be perfect before you step out, you're never going to step out. Missing the mark is the title of this message. If you would, I'm just going to read the introduction, and we're going to look at some things here. The word sin is commonly translated as missing the mark. It's an archery kind of word. But sin, as described in the Bible, is far more than some sort of spiritual target practice. God has set moral parameters by which we are to live, and when we miss the mark of morality as set by God, we call it sin. The Bible teaches that there is only one thing that can cover our trespasses or sins against God's moral code. And what is that? Only innocent blood can cover our sin. The problem is our blood has been tainted by sin. And because of that, it's impure. It cannot satisfy the sin debt that we each have compiled only the blood of the innocent Christ, only the blood of the innocent Christ can pay the price that the sinner has on his or her head. Jesus came to die 
to set us free from the eternal consequences of sin, which is what? Eternal death. Today, let's consider what it means to avoid living a life of missing the mark. Uh, we're going to look at these four things. We're going to look at the conception of sin, the commonality of sin, the consequences of sin, and the commutation of sin. We're going to be in James. If you want to go there, we can follow along, but it's there for you. Um, James 1, 13 through 15. Actually, it's not on there, but if you want to flip over there or, or go over there on your phone, however you want to do that, it says, Let no man say when he is tempted that he is tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God doesn't do that. But each one, here's what the problem is, everybody. But each one... You, me, each one is tempted when he or she is drawn away from his, by his own desires and enticed. It's all on you, man. It's all on me. It's all on us. Then, when desire is conceived, we're talking about the conception or the birth of sin. When the desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings what? Death. When we act on that sin, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was talking and he said, you know, some people say, the people of old say, um, don't commit adultery. But I'm here to tell you, if you lust after a, a, a woman or a, vice versa, you've already committed adultery. Jesus came and right before he, remember, right before he said that, he said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fill, fulfill the law. Amen. And then he goes on to say, you know, the, that law that they've been talking about, those stringent laws, well, let me tell you what the real thing is, and he made it even more stringent. And he made the case, he said, I came to fulfill the law because you can't do it. So because there's a curse, the Bible calls it the curse of the law, which is death, and we can't fulfill it ourselves, Jesus came and lived a perfect life and died and rose again so that we can come under his victory and come out from under the curse of the law. Only the pure blood of an innocent sacrifice can pay for our sin debt. And you see types and shadows. The Bible is full of types and shadows in the Old Testament. Pointing, everything points towards Jesus. We all know that the Old Testament looks forward to Jesus, towards to the future, towards Jesus. The New Testament looks back at Jesus. Everything is at the cross of Christ. At the cross of Christ is where we walk horizontally in this life and we go vertically when we meet God, either up or down, either up or down. That's your crossroad right there. Amen? The, cross of crows, the crossroad of your life is the cross of Christ. Does that make sense to anybody? 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such is common to man. You're not the only one going through it. It's common to man. But God is faithful. That's some good news here who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. There's always a way out. Well, what's that way out? He says here. But with the temptation, God will also make the way, not a way, the way, the way is Jesus, amen, the way of escape so that you will be able to bear it. It's all on us. Maybe you need to not click on that link there. Maybe you need to change the channel. Maybe you need to take those earbuds off. Maybe you need to not go to that place where you've been going. We have a way of escape from every temptation, and we can't go around blaming anybody but ourselves. So if you hear something rustling under your bed at night, it's most likely not the devil, probably a mouse. Amen? The devil's only, God is everywhere all the time. The devil's only one place. He can only be one place at a time. And for us to go say that the devil may be doing it, well, you're just shooting yourself short. You're making excuses. I'm making excuses. And we make excuses. We're really good about making excuses. Have you noticed that? We're really good about making excuses. Well, my wife did it. My husband did it. Not me. We're pretty good at that. Amen? Or the devil made me do it. We have a, a, one of our great granddaughters who loves... It. If, if there's a... Something rustling under your bed. It's not the devil. It could be a mouse or a great granddaughter because she likes going down there. For some reason, she likes laying under the bed. She'll put pillows down there. She goes down there, hangs out. What are you doing down there? Hanging out under the bed. I don't know why. You know it's more comfortable up here? Not for me. I like it down here. The conception of sin. Sin is conceived. 
All living things have a life cycle. The mind, if left to wander, it can wander into temptation. Temptation, if left unchecked, conceives sin. Sin, if allowed to mature, leads to death. And here's the good news. The bad news is, in sin there is death. The good news is, in Christ there is life. Amen. How about the commonality of sin? Romans 5.12 says, in that section of Scripture, the Apostle Paul, he's talking about uh, the corruptible body, the corruptible life, our, this reality we, we, that we inhabit. And he says, when we are glorified, we will put on the incorruptible and we'll be perfect. You see, God made you perfect, amen? But the reality is this life in this world, which, is, um, which was sur supplanted by the devil take, when he stole the, took the dominion from Adam, how by sin, through sin, has corrupted this life and this world. And so in that section of Scripture in Romans 15, and right in there, Romans 5, and then 1 Corinthians, and there's a couple of places, but here he's talking about the first Adam, which is Adam, and the second Adam, which is Jesus. The Adam messed up, Jesus came to fix the problem, amen? And so when Adam uh, messed up, all men came un under that sinful nature. That's called the original sin. The original sin has to do with our sinful nature. We all are products of the original sin. So the com commonality of sin, again, Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men. Why? Because all men sin. So we are all products of Adam's sin. And it goes on to say, even if you didn't sin like Adam, some, you might have sinned some other way, but you still sin, Right? And so we understand that sin leads to death, the commonality of sin. We all have something in common. We all have a sinful nature. Amen. The Bible teaches that because Adam sinned, all of his descendants, all humans, inherited a sinful nature and have the tendency towards disobedience against God's moral standards. That's that mark. That's that target. Amen. God, that's that market, that target, and we're shooting, and we're shooting, and we're trying to live right, and we're missing, and we're missing, and we're missing, and when we miss, we sin. Amen? But how many know the more you practice, the better you get? So if we practice in our righteousness, right? The Bible says that we should uh, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, right? That's a, the, the salvation is related to righteousness, because only uh, the righteous have that salvation. All men are sinners. All Christians are saints. You know that? The Bible calls us saints. And sometimes we're not very saintly, but the Bible says that we are saints. You have the saints and you have the ain'ts. First John 3.19 says, okay, so we just read and we just, that all men sin, right? All men sin. But here, why, then why does it say in 1 John 3.19 if you want to jot that down, he who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Jesus came for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. What's that? Sin. Whoever has been born of God. Do we have any believers in here? Are you a Christian this morning? Whoever is born of God does not sin. Well, he must have not saw me last week. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his, Jesus' seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Well, if we just read that everyone is a sinner, we've all, we all sin, then why does it say we can't sin? Well, it's talking about our conscience, you guys. It's talking about, I don't want to sin. Do you want to sin? I don't want to sin. Even if I might stumble once in a while, I don't want to sin. It doesn't set well with my spirit. So he says he cannot sin. He means he's, he's, you don't practice sin. And you're fighting against that sinful lifestyle, whatever it may be. I don't like it. I know it's wrong. God, help me. I want to get out of this. I cannot do this anymore is what he's saying. But we stumble. And we fall. And we go backwards. And we go forward. We go sideways. We stop doing what we're supposed to be doing. And then we're not doing what we're, what we're not supposed to. You guys all know that, right? The great apostle Paul, see if I get it right. I always mess this up. But I, you all know what I mean. 
Why do I do the things I'm not supposed to do and the things I'm not supposed to do, those things I do? Because we have that sinful nature, and it's a struggle. The Bible says that there's an old man living in us, and Jesus came to kill off that old man, and we're supposed to lay that old man aside, get him out of the house, but sometimes we put him in the closet just in case. We put that thing in the freezer because I might change my mind in a week instead of getting it out of our lives, and we hold on to it just in case, and that's the problem. We're supposed to, the Bible says that we're dead to sin. What's it mean to be dead to sin? It means it has no power over you. But we allow it to move in our lives. We let it come into us and we submit to it. We're alive in Christ and dead to sin. Somebody should say amen. But that's a choice. That's a choice. It, you know, God didn't make robots. He gave us a free will and we said, I want you to follow me. I'm still going to be here. I'm still going to love you. I'm not going to send you to hell, Christian. But you could be a lot more productive and a lot happier if you would let that stuff go. The conception of sin the commonality of sin. We all have that sinful nature. How about the consequences of sin? Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is what? Death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life. Well, where is that? This is life in Christ. Jesus, our Lord. The consequences of sin. Every living thing bears fruit of the same kind. Amen? If a pear tree is grafted, it bears pears. Sin bears sin. Sin is death, and sin bears the fruit of sin. Right? Which is death. All sinners are dead in sin. All Christians are dead to sin. All sinners are dead in sin. All Christians are dead to sin. It has no power over us. It's dead. Again, I want to reiterate, but some of us let it just kind of creep on back in. Amen. And so all of these things are decisions that if we want to hit the mark, the target that God has set, he said, live like this, don't live like that, we have to practice. And the Bible talks about practicing sin, practicing unrighteousness. It means given, and it talks about giving over to sin. There's a difference between stumbling into sin and being given over or practicing sin. We all struggle, everybody. We all struggle. But it's a process and we have to make, some of us have to make better decisions before we allow that conception of sin by, uh, by following through with the things. The Bible, there's a scripture that says, make no allowances for sin. What does that mean? It means don't make appointments to sin. My wife's out of town this, this in a couple weeks. I'm going to make it my, set it up now, right? Right? That kind of stuff. Make appointments to sin. No, don't think that way. Say, no, you know, don't make a point. How can I phrase that? Don't make appointments to sin is the best way I can say it. Right? Yeah. Don't start marking your calendar. I'm gonna, this is my sin day over here. I'm going to go over here. Right, don't do that. Don't do that. The consequences of sin. Is this speaking to anybody? Romans 8, 1, 2. We all love this scripture, Christians. There is no, therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we love stopping right there. And, but we need to continue. It goes on. Who do not walk, in a, walk according to the flesh, the sinful flesh, but according to the spirit, the righteous spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. These are spiritual laws. There's physical laws. You know, what's that? We have a couple the, not, not theologians, doctorates. We have a... Uh, a doctorate back there at the soundboard. We have a doctorate over here, I believe. And then Marty, the old violin player, he had a doctrine, a doctorate in some mechanical engineering and stuff. So they know all, all these physical laws, right? Physical laws that God has set in place. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. That's a physical law, right? What goes up must come down. Those are physical laws, but there's spiritual laws. And the spiritual law, there's a the law of sin and death. That's an unbreakable spiritual law that God has established. And those spiritual laws are just as valid, if not more valid, than the physical laws. Amen? 
You don't jump out of an airplane without a parachute. Because the physical law dictates that if you ain't got no parachute, it's not going to be a good landing. Amen? So there's physical laws that we have to understand. But the spiritual laws also are set in stone. How about the commutation of sin? Here's the gospel. The commutation of sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him, the Father made the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God. Where? In him. In Christ, we are righteous. When the Father looks at you, no matter what you did last week or on the way to church or what you're thinking about right now, hopefully we're thinking about Jesus, but whatever you may be going through in your mind right now, in your desires, God looks at you and he sees you under the covering of the blood of his son because he shed his blood to cover us, right? And the Father looks down, he sees us as righteous. And so we are the righteousness of God, where? In Christ. What's that? That's a spiritual position. There's only two spiritual positions that matter. Either you're in Christ or you're not in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you're under the impending wrath of God. But if you're in Christ, you're covered by the blood of Christ and he sees you, the Bible says, sparkling clean. Amen? But that's a choice. The penalty of sin is death. Jesus came and died in your place that your penalty might be commuted, might be dismissed. Guilty, but the penalty is commuted. Yeah, you're guilty, but I'm going to acquit you by my blood. Amen? Guilty, but commuted. All sinners have been convicted. All Christians have been acquitted. You are acquitted no matter how you may have lived. Amen? But that doesn't mean, we just talked about that, that, does, that doesn't mean we live any way we want because that's license to sin. And license to sin is the spirit of the Nicolaitans. And Jesus says, I hate the spirit of the Nicolaitans because that is license to sin. Just because I'm under grace, I'm going to live any way I want because the Bible says, Paul says in Romans, he said, the more grace that God gives us, the more he is glorified. So let's sin a whole bunch so we can really glorify God. See, and that's a fallacy. That's a wrong kind of way of thinking. But there's people that think that way, and that's license to sin. There's Christian liberty. Jesus says, I have come to set the captives free and bring the good news of liberty to those who would receive me. You have been set free from the consequences of sin and from legalism. Am I losing anybody? The conception of sin, the commonality of sin, the consequences of sin and the commutation of sin. Romans 3, 24 through 25 says for that we have been justified freely by God's grace through the redemption. Wait, what's that redemption? That's being redeemed. What's redeemed mean? You, you've seen those bottles that says California Redemption Value. Somebody, that bottle, is, it might be worthless to somebody, but has value. There's a redemption value. And somebody's willing to pay for it. And so we have been redeemed. Jesus says, you have value. And I'm going to pay the price to redeem you because you have value. Some people say, well, put that in the garbage heap. It's nothing. No, he says, no, there's a redemption value. I'm going to redeem that person because they have value to me. And I'm willing to pay the price to redeem that person. That's the redemption. We have been freely justified by God's grace through the redemption. Took us out of that trash heap of sin. And he redeemed us, washed us clean, refilled us, and, re and wants to reuse us. So that in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation. Propitiation means the appeasement or the payment for there's a price for that. Somebody has to pay for that. So he's the propitiation. His blood is the payment. Amen? By his blood. How? Well, how do we get some of that? He said, through faith. You can't be good enough to earn it. It's through faith. But you haven't been so bad that you can't grab it either. By faith. Amen? The Bible documents times when man's sin became so prevalent that God in his righteous wrath eliminated whole societies. Noah. The world was messed up. He came down and wiped it out and reestablished a worship team. 
Sodom. It was so messed up. Wiped it out. It says also in the Bible that God's righteous wrath is pending and it's coming and it's going to fall. And those who are in Christ will be spared from the righteous wrath. And those who are given over to sin and reject the free gift, the Bible calls it, of grace by the blood of Christ are in big trouble. In the days of Noah, God moved against sin. In the days of the wicked rulers, God moved against nations. The Bible tells us that God's righteous wrath will one day be loosed in the final battle against those who are, what, given over to sin. God, in his mercy and grace, has set parameters or a target that we can aim for by which you and I can live. Does anybody want to live? Pray that though you may miss the mark of righteousness and stumble into sin, you won't allow yourself to be a practitioner of sin. Someone who's given over to sin. Father, we thank you for your words. Does that speak to anybody? I hope it did. You know, there's some things we really have to consider. Sometimes church is not fluffy. Sometimes church can be really, you know, we have to really consider these things or else we're not doing, we're doing ourselves a, a misservice. This is not fun and games. Church is serious stuff. And so we, God in his graciousness has set these parameters and these truths that we might do better. I want to do better. I know you want to do better. Let's do better, everybody. For the new jobs, for the new relationships, for the new opportunities, for whatever is going to happen next. Also, we are going to be doing communion soon. So as that's passing out, feel free to accept the elements if it feels on your heart that it's time to do that. Um, and just take that when you feel led. But we're just going to celebrate. We're going to sing this morning. And we're going to get excited because God is on the move. Yeah. 